Hello, I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. I'm coming to you from The Interval here in San Francisco, where I will be joined by our speaker tonight, Jason Tester, to watch the pre-recorded version of his talk, along with answering questions from you all afterwards. Jason is a foresight researcher with the Institute for the Future here in San Francisco, and has recently been exploring where futurism, sexual orientation, and identity meet. Tonight, he's gonna to give us a taste of that research and show us how looking at the future through an LGBTQ lens can help benefit us all. Welcome, Jason Tester. Thank you, Xander. Thank you for all for having me here at Long Now. Um, as Xander said, I am Jason, and I'm on a 20-year journey to make sense of my queerness, which has been a part of my life for about that long. I've also been a professional futurist for about the same amount of time, 20 years. And to prove it to you, here's an aged image of what I might look like at age 60. Now, I've long suspected that these two halves of my life weren't a coincidence. And I think I've now discovered why, and I'm excited to really share that with you tonight. I'm trusting most of the Long Now audience will know the basic terms of sexual orientation and gender identity that I'll be using today. But I do want to define the word queer because we really can't start talking about it until I do. So what is queer? Well, as an adjective, queer describes all the sexual and gender identities other than straight and cisgender. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people may all identify with the word queer. Queer is sometimes used to express that sexuality and gender can be complicated, can change over time, and might not fit neatly into either or identities like male or female, gay or straight. So when I say queer the future, I mean it in two ways. And this first way is based around queer the adjective. And that's, I want to identify the future forces that will disproportionately disrupt the lives of LGBTQ people over the next 20 to 30 years. I want to center our lives in foresight research and futures narratives, and especially to imagine interventions to at least rebalance these imbalanced impacts. As one example of a foresight question I'm working with, how will caregiving assistance and aging in place technologies deal with LGBTQ people and their relationships? It won't come as a shock to learn that LGBT elders are much more likely to have not had children, up to three to four times more likely. But even today, 20% of LGBT older adults say they have no one to call in a time of crisis. That is 10 times the general elderly population. And a mere 8% of senior housing centers offer services targeted at LGBT older adults. We're already deep in, in a caregiving crisis between supply and need. And it's likely that LGBTQ people will need technologies of care more than any other demographic. Another question I'm exploring is, will AI and other intelligent systems built with cisgender heterosexual training data constantly reinforce the gender binary? Imagine bathrooms in the future, particularly in conservative areas or regions of the world, equipped with vision recognition that scan for biological markers or stereotypical gender expressions before they would actually admit someone. It's not hard to imagine a future where more of us are living as gender fluid while surrounded by, by, by binary bias. Machine intelligence programmed without any exposure to other expressions or experiences of gender. And last but not least, there's the big stuff that will affect us all. A study that came out last May discovered that in a business as usual climate scenario, in the absence of migration, one third of the global population is projected to experience a mean annual temperature of greater than or equal to 29 degrees Celsius. And that's about 84 degrees Fahrenheit which is currently only found in about 0.8% of the Earth's land surface, and that's mostly concentrated in the Sahara. So the report goes on to say, specifically, 3.5 billion people will be exposed to a mean annual temperature of greater than or equal to 29 degrees Celsius, living in a Sahara-like climate. I read that, and that's a shocking statistic. It's truly hard to comprehend. But since I've been doing this work, I now take 10% of these impossibly large numbers to understand the impact on people who are likely to identify in the coming decades as queer or not totally heterosexual. So we take that same sentence and we queerify it, and we get specifically 350 million queer people will be exposed to mean annual temperatures greater than or equal to 29 degrees Celsius. Now, 3.5 billion people living in a Sahara-like climate is likely to yield severe constraints of vital resources and overall miserable conditions. But now, imagine being queer or transgender, living in this newly inhospitable climate that's located in a region of the planet that's already inhospitable to your very existence. Life in that, in that scenario sounds pretty hellish. Another report last year projected that up to 1.2 billion people could be displaced by climate change by 2050, by mid-century. Now, I took, applying the same queer math, that's the, the same headline reads, climate crisis could displace 120 million queer people. Now, my goal when I query these numbers isn't to advocate for my people at the expense of other groups or to create an us versus them mentality but it's simply to call out that large areas of the planet are rapidly becoming doubly inhospitable to queer lives, who should have equal rights to the human universals of love, 
happiness, and true expression. In the coming decades, we are likely to face mass migration at nearly unimaginable levels, but also unprecedented resource scarcity and triage, and ultimately, an inability to provide the necessities of life for everyone that needs them. So here are, here are a couple of concrete examples of this. According to the UN, 5 billion people could have poor access to fresh water by 2050. And as early as 2030, global water demand is expected to outstrip supply by 40%. And lastly, the UN estimates that the planet will need twice as much food in 2050 as it does today, while grain yields decline as temperatures increase. Now, I know that these aren't uniquely LGBTQ issues, but they're likely to disproportionately affect queer people, given current statistical realities like this. 27% of LGBT adults experienced food insecurity in the prior year, compared to only 17% of non-LGBT adults. And 22% of, of LGBT people in the US live in poverty, compared to only 16%. So given these disproportionate statistical realities today, it's very likely that they'll be, they will extend into the future and we'll see these same disproportionate impacts going forward. So if distribution of critical resources is already this out of balance, when we, don't, when, we, when we have plenty of food and water to go around today, imagine a world when we don't. I hope LGBTQ people will fare equally, but I truly fear we won't. The purpose of my life has now become, if we are indeed all going extinct, let's go extinct together as equals. Which brings me to my, the first thesis of Queering the Future. And I believe that we, as a queer and allied community, have one generation, roughly 20 to 30 years, to achieve a basic floor of LGBTQ respect and dignity across the planet before things get truly, unambiguously, critically dire for billions of people. And this was the widespread lived reality found in the majority of hearts and minds of a culture, not just toothless legislative proclamations. I mean, not just would you let your bisexual neighbor borrow some of your water rations for her family? Or would you offer your trans customer shelter from the heat or your gay distant cousin a seat in your raft? Unfortunately, that scenario of mass acceptance seems unlikely in the relatively short time frame demanded of it, and a scary prospect for hundreds of millions of LGBTQ adults and young adults if you don't achieve it. But perpetually looming right around the corner is another potential ex existential threat to my people. Last year, the largest study of the biology of homosexuality was conducted using genetic data from 23andMe and the UK Biobank, so about 500,000 participants total. Their conclusion was that some genes can account for about one-third of the influence over whether someone has ever had same-sex sex at least once in their lives. But not all geneticists supported this research. Many in the LGBT affinity group of the very institute leading this study were opposed including a colleague of the research leader who said in part, I have yet to see a compelling argument that the potential benefits of this study outweigh its potential harms. And indeed, every year, and I've been studying the biology of sexuality for years, there are new groundbreaking studies. There are also ongoing investigations into epigenetic mechanisms of sexuality and a potential connection to hormonal conditions in the womb. We're doing a decent, if slow, job at banning so-called gay cures. Now, these are deeply harmful psychological treatments passing off as beneficial therapies. But what if a gay vaccine became possible, cheaply, at scale, available for everyone? I'll grant you, this is a wild card scenario, low probability, but speaking as a queer man myself, very extremely high impact. But please keep watching after I say this, but I cannot totally dismiss the notion that a gay vac vaccine would be all bad. It might offer the potential to eliminate the suffering of hundreds of millions of LGBTQ people not yet born, especially in regions that are likely to become inhospitable to queerness and which happen to be those regions becoming literally inhospitable to humanity itself. To be clear, it wasn't lost on me that I might be turning into a queer man considering eugenics against his own people. But I am deeply afraid for our future between the prospect of a century of triaging water and food for hundreds of millions of queer people, while seeming closer than ever to true understanding of the biology of homosexuality. I'll admit that these are deep-seated existential fears. But I also need to flip that fear which leads me to my second meaning of queer of the future. Queer can also be used as a verb, and this definition is proposed by Charlie Glickman. As he proposed, fundamentally, queering is an act of ongoing transformation, both within ourselves and in relation to the world around us. To queer something is to take a look at its foundations and question them. We can explore its limits, its biases, its boundaries. We can look for places where there's elasticity to, or discover ways in where we can transform it into something new. To queer is to examine our assumptions and decide which of them we want to keep change, discard, or play with. So I started asking, does queerness confer any sort of advantage, especially for the wild future world we're headed towards? What even is queerness beyond the theory that we help the tribe raise kids? 
despite or maybe because of all the trauma and marginalization that could come from being born queer in any family, in any city, in any country in the world? Have we created something in our culture found in the periphery and underground that has been waiting for this moment? What if queer culture itself with some, with some surprising universals across the globe, is itself a cultural evolutionary mutation, ready to confer advantages of survival and resilience on the, on the larger population? The core irony, of course, that these traits are sourced from a group of people who cannot reproduce themselves, but may be able, able to help humanity as a whole adapt and thrive into the future. Which leads me to the thesis number two, and that's that the queer perspective is made up of some surprisingly shared traits and tendencies that will be useful for societies and people to thrive in the coming decades ahead. Put another way, queerness can keep things cool in hotter futures. To date, I've identified five traits that can answer both of these questions. What is queerness? And what mindsets and practices will confer success in the future we're likely headed towards? A queer future could be more than it is today, more transformative, more equitable, hell, even more fabulous for everyone with a touch of a queer eye. Or maybe it's actually the future itself that's already becoming more queer, and all of us need to play catch up. I can be your guide, like Virgil in the Inferno, or the MC from Cabaret, or any one of the hosts from Queer Eye, all rolled into one. Of course, queerness is more than these five traits, and success in the future will require more skills than this list. But I hope seeing queerness and the future in conversation together like this sparks some novel insights for about how you approach the future, the lenses and biases that we all bring to our forecasting. So think of this as a guide to how to queer the future. And step number one is to question prevailing systems. Queerness fundamentally exists in opposition to arguably the most prevailing system in the human condition, which is heterosexual reproduction. In fact, the DNA of queerness is suspicion or outright rejection of norms, orthodoxy, and continuation scenarios. Because norms and continuation typically kept us miserable or dead for millennia. A default to question the unquestionable is a strong foundation to readily envision transformative alternatives and original ways of doing and being. Jose Esteban Munoz wrote Cruising Utopia just as the light at the end of the tunnel was shining towards the, the end of the AIDS epidemic, and we could begin to see queerness again for, for its positivity and for its hopefulness. And he wrote, queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. And this is an infamous pamphlet that was passed out by ACT UP in the 1990 New York A Pride Parade. Being queer means leading a different sort of life. It's not about the mainstream, profit margins, patriotism, patriarchy, or being assimilated. It's not about executive directors, privilege, and elitism. It's about being on the margins, defining ourselves. Well, many of us first heard of uh, prison and police abolition this summer with many of the Black Lives Matter riots. Um, resisting and questioning the dominant systems have of police and incarceration in the carceral state have long been in the DNA of queerness itself, going all the way back to the 1966 Compton's Cafeteria riots here in San Francisco, or three years later uh, at the, the root of the Stonewall riots, which was an anti-police demonstration. And as noted activist Dr. Angela Davis has pointed out, as it was true for so much of queer history, it was transgender people who actually pointed the way to this resistance. Dr. Davis says, we support the trans community precisely because the trans community has taught us how to challenge that which is totally accepted as normal. If it is possible to challenge the gender binary, then we can certainly effectively resist prisons and police. Now, coming out is also a form of questioning the prevailing systems. By choosing to come out, queer people go through a process. They start a personal journey that consciously places them on the margins of what is quantitatively mainstream. And that comes with a double-edged sword you no longer have an autopilot, the same as many of your straight heterosexual friends do. And rather than being superfluous to change, the margins are in fact the foundry of the future where societies innovate and grow. So the very act of coming out, the very act of declaring yourself a queer person is itself questioning the mainstream system and starting to make the future in a new way. Our second step in how to queer the future is about rejecting binaries and binary thinking. Most forecasts of work and life in the future Imagine greater fluidity in our identities, our preferences, self-expression, and our communications and interactions. But queerness found comfort with nuance outside of categories early on, simply because we've been forced to craft our own alternatives to most institutions in society. Queer adaptations to the binaries of married or single, or family or friend, or even our own internal compasses of attraction and gender in each moment, often begin like all novel futures as outliers. If not considered fully deviant, then certainly not accepted by the mainstream before time passes, they're reconsidered for their benefits and suddenly we have widespread appeal. Let's take, let's take the gender binary, for example. 
The gender binary is so entrenched in our lives that we will literally explode the world to reinforce it. These are scenes from gender binary reveal parties over the past year, in which couples dramatically reveal the gender of their child through a pink or blue substance, such as exploding smoke. The binary is so reinforced that so many couples have taken this to an extreme with their reveals, inadvertently lighting tens of thousands of acres on fire. Now, that biology does not equal identity often gets lost in the spectacle. Binary, defi binary defenders have crashed planes, enlisted alligators, backfired trucks, and gotten into fights at and kicked out of Applebee's. And most unfortunately, once exploded a pipe bomb into a guest's skull, killing her instantly. As The Atlantic put it, how many people have to die before we're done with gender reveals? And I would ask, with gender itself. Another example of resisting binaries uh, comes to us from sex columnist Dan Savage and his term that he coined about 10 years ago called monogamish. And he coined this term to describe the arrangement that he has with his husband for occasional extramarital sex with other people and the rules and the, and the requirements that go with that condition. Savage was aiming to create a more realistic sexual ethic that would prize honesty, a little flexibility, and when necessary, forgiveness. Something to live between promiscuity and monogamy, which Savage considers right for many, but unnatural for most. And, then, and so again, another queer adaptation to a, to, to, to a heteronormative binary. I could have put up many headlines here to show just how queer the younger generations are proving to be than their older counterparts. Teens these days are queer AF, study says. Only 48% of Gen Zs identify as exclusively heterosexual, compared to 65% of millennials aged 21 to 34. Those belonging to Generation Z also rejected the gender binary while shopping. Only 44% said they always bought clothes designed for their own gender, versus 54% of millennials. So as we can see, the gender binary, at least with these new younger generations, is falling fast. Our next step in our journey to how to queer the future is connect intersectionally. Now, this really starts from an assumption that a more egalitarian and broadly prosperous future seems difficult to achieve if we can't agree to live and interact in both deep diversity and deep harmony with each other. As simple as it sounds, working at widespread scale to acknowledge and understand that the lived experiences of people from different backgrounds will be different is a very hard notion for many people to truly grasp including others' experiences of discrimination and privilege, particularly realities of people of color, but also the lives of those with disabilities and people with fewer means than ourselves. This concept is known as intersectionality. While relatively simple to convey, and can be very difficult to put into practice. But without this basic floor of mutual respect and acceptance, we may not survive. Intersectionality is arguably the most important skill for us making it into the future. If so many of our most talented community members hold back from their true selves, their full creativity, their full joy and passion from the, from the unprecedented task we face of remaking the world. Because the fullness of their identities feels unwelcome, we do not get all of the ideas that we need to make it into the next world. This is where I have to be the first to admit that queerness, and particularly white queerness, is far from perfect at making this future our reality. The first group of gay rights groups formed after Stonewall were deeply intersectional and multiracial. And many argue that the recent focus on gay marriage took us away from the more important issues of economic and employment equity. As one signal that the queer community is trying to re-queer its own future, we've, we've amended the pride flag to acknowledge and center the lives and importance of queer people of color in our movement, adding black and brown stripes on top of the already seven color rainbow. One way in which queer people as a community do have an advantage is through the shared advantage of marginalization. One experience of marginalization predisposes you to, um, to greater understanding of compound marginalizations that other people may face. One way to think about intersectionality is, a is, is as a tool for augmented empathy. Empathy, of course, will be a vital skill in this increasingly crowded, automated, and unequal, polarized, and mediated century so far. Understanding the way another person encounters the world, accepted or shunned by their peers, bosses, and strangers, is a deeply human act. Now, as we're talking about practicing inter intersectionally, I want to make a, a bit of a side note here to say that I firmly believe that the future of the future is being created by transgender women of color and gender non-binary people of color, and that we should all trust their leadership, particularly those, in the, uh, those of us in the queer community. I can't highly recommend enough the documentary The Future of Trans by Amara Jones and the Trans Agenda for Liberation's Call to Action to grow your understanding of their deeply intersectional lives. Additionally, the exciting intersectional futurism of people like Lonnie Brooks, who's pioneering Afro-queer futures, and whose long now talk you can easily Google and watch. Our next step in how to queer the future is one very much related to some fundamentals of queerness, embracing pleasure and joy. 
Historically, queerness has long prioritized feelings of pleasure and joy as indicators of happiness and well-being, far, be far before modern medicine accepted their value. But not just med medicinally, queerness has spoken of these as, as essential precursors to unspeakable heights of creativity and uninhibited ideation, basically found foundations to imagining radically new futures. But even this had become taboo since queer pleasure, queer pleasure was deeply stigmatized when LGBTQ people were fighting battles on multiple fronts against AIDS and for equal, equal access to mainstream institutions like the right to marry and adopt. The fundamental sexuality of queerness went away to, for many people to find, respect, find respectability in the mainstream society. But this is starting to come back in, in movements like pleasure activism. Pleasure activism is the organized struggle to reprioritize bliss and sensuality, to build individual and collective resilience, and ultimately as a necessary foundation to conjure better worlds. I'd like to share this quote from pleasure activism author Adrienne Marie Brown. You're not going to forget the suffering in the world just because you had a great orgasm. You're going to have more resilience for turning and facing that suffering if you're also in touch with the part of your life that feels amazing, and not just the total catastrophes that are happening. Or as our favorite queer futurist of all time, Jose Esteban Munoz put it in Cruising Utopia, some will say that all we have are the pleasures of this moment, but we must never settle for that minimal transport. We must dream and enact new and better pleasures, other ways of being in the world, and ultimately new worlds. Which This quote really fascinates me as someone who is always trying to come up with new ideas and new, and new transformative, more accurate futures, more wild futures, that what if we actually based what, based that not on technology, not on, on GDP, not on value, but on pleasure. And, we, and really our goal was to find new pleasure in new, in new futures. That really excites me. And our last step in how to queer the future is hustling between worlds. So for a long time, to find companionship and work when neither were available to us in mainstream society, queer folks for millennia have been re-perceiving re and repurposing spaces and platforms to seek their hidden layers, latent gigs, and the underground social networks, when any form of trade or hustling existed on the margins of respectable society. Queerness pioneered this, this rhythm of finding ad hoc latent opportunity, the hustle that now truly defines the future. Work, for food, love, everything on demand if you know where and how to look. Only recently has proficiency of the hustle and juggling multiple hustles become an admired ability. By now you've heard of, used, or as you're watching me, are also getting notifications from a location-based smartphone app. But Grindr for gay men started it all. <clears throat> Launched less than two years after the iPhone, Grindr was an instantly game-changing tool for the hustle and changed the future of online dating. Rather than congregating in bars to find romance and limited by who else happened to be there, Grindr gave you the superpower to stay home and see the previously invisible layer of other guys near you. Grindr didn't invent mobile social networking, but it certainly did set an early model for how we come to see our, think of our phones as secret decoders, revealing the latent possibilities surrounding us for everything from car rental to food delivery to romance. Futurist Madeline Ashby, who has done a great deal of, of speculative work and um, recently wrote How to Future, um, has this passage that I love that captures a lot about the, the relationship between hustling and the future. She writes, for a long time, the future has belonged to people who have not had to struggle. And I think that will still be true. But as more and more systems collapse, currency, energy, the ability to get water, the ability to work, the future will increasingly belong to those who know how to hustle. And those people are not the people who are producing those purely optimistic futures. The future belongs to those who know how to hustle. And MJ Petroni, a local queer futurist and UX designer, in an interview, he talked about what he values looking for in queer employees. We often look for people who have existed in lots of different worlds, and in walking back and forth between these spaces and never being fully at home, they learn a lot about the unspoken rules and assumptions and codes and values that exist. So I really wanted to try to answer the question in these five traits, how can querying the future solve our most wicked problems? How can querying the future help anybody? And I hope that across these five skills or traits that show that queer folks across countries and millennia have demonstrated a nimble resilience prosperity for adaptation and resourcefulness, a healthy skepticism and embrace for other worlds, a continual, if far from perfect, practice of deep empathy that keeps us striving to do better, and a widespread acceptance of the connection between our biologies and our desires and achieving our destinies under any conditions. But on an even deeper level, we won't achieve transformative solutions to our most critical problems using the same legacy tools that we've used in the past. 
We need everyone to bring their ideas and engagement to bear on the complexity, complexity of the future. Yet 1.5 billion people currently live in 72 countries where homosexuality is illegal, and billions more live in countries without widespread cultural acceptance. And we know that being your full self makes a difference in your participation and your citizenship in a society or in a workplace. As one example, the Boston Consulting Group has found that the ability to be out at work helps workers feel twice as much psychological safety and one and a half times more empowered and free to take creative risks. Imagine, imagine, the, imagine the other freedoms that billions of people lose being in the closet around the world every single day. But setting aside productivity or innovation on any measure, I want to end on this statistic, which I learned last year and has really become one of my North Stars. Researchers at the, at the Family Acceptance Project at San Francisco State University, one question they're asked is, do you believe that you will ever be a happy LGBT adult? For queer youth who come from families rated extremely accepting, 92%, 92% are able to imagine themselves in happy futures. For queer youth from families who, out, who, who outright shun or reject them, only 35% have this ability. Think about that for a minute. Two thirds of LGBTQ young people who had the misfortune to be born to families that cannot accept them have lost the ability to imagine their future selves being happy. I can't see how losing that ability is any different from losing one's fundamental sense of hope, hope for themselves, hope for the world, hope for their, for the, for their individual future or ours collectively. So it's phenomena like this that happen every day Anywhere an LGBTQ kid is growing up, knowing that they're different, afraid to express it, even in the most progressive regions, let alone the most conservative, that motivates me to keep querying the future and showing that the future can be queer. To create more scenarios with thriving queer protagonists, to uncover the trends that will particularly impact LGBTQ people, not just to preempt emerging victimhood, but also to empower them to grab the wheel and grab us by the future they see and deserve. To learn more about any of the LGBT foresight research that I presented today, please check out the research home at queerthefuture.org. This has been me so far with the help of a lot of friends and experts and, and, and people, smarter people I'm talking to. But I would love this to be a home where anyone, anyone who identifies as a queer futurist, a trans futurist, a non-binary futurist, anywhere in the world can come and can share their ideas and we can create collective visions for how we want our lives and our communities to live in the future. Thank you very much.